In the world, there is always a man who gets hit by a truck and gets sent to a world beyond their imagination. That was exactly what happened to our protagonist, Hitoshi Nozaki. People in his life used to call him a wildling because of his name and appearance, but now he was suddenly in a strange forest in a different world, with only straw covering his lower body. He sat by a fire he made, staring at the food that was being cooked. But how did this happen, and why to him of all people? As he ate his food, he thought back on how he had gotten himself in this situation, sifting through his memories. It all started with a truck. When he was on his way to work, he saw a student in the street about to get hit by a vehicle, to which Nozaki felt the sudden urge to want to save that student, running out and pushing them out of the way. This had unfortunately caused him to get run over by the truck instead. As he bled out in the street and started to lose consciousness, his last thought was him admitting that he would choose to reincarnate if there was a chance of it. And that was what happened. Nozaki felt as though he was falling from the sky into the nothingness below him, and everything had gone dark. He was unconscious for not too long before the man had woken up, looking up at the sky above him and seeing the leaves rattle in the wind. He was definitely in another world. Quickly getting up, Nozaki looked around him in order to figure out his next move. He didn't have any cheats nor any clothes on his body. He told himself to calm down so he could assess his surroundings and make priorities. Once he stood up, he found a large tree at some place in the forest. With a struggle, he got to the top of the tree so he could see where to go next. To his surprise and disappointment, there were only trees as far as the eye could see. He wondered if it was going to be dangerous to move in the dark, but he changed his thoughts and focused on his priority to find water. Once he did that, he would make a base and find food. But before that, he needed something to cover himself. He had stripped some bark from nearby trees and tied them together in order to make a straw skirt. It felt uncomfortable to him as it would prevent him from focusing on exploring, but he indirectly thanked the Discovery Channel for protecting his dignity as a human. It was now time for him to transition onto the survival part of things. Nozaki walked through the forest, struggling to get through the dense environment. He wondered if he was really going to find a water source, but suddenly he heard a sound in the bushes, causing the man to freeze in fear. The sound stopped and Nozaki knew that it sounded like a small animal. He realized that his eyes weren't as effective in the forest while his ears were being overwhelmed with information. He needed to use his ears to his advantage while trying to find things in the forest. Nozaki continued his exploration, focusing on all the sounds around him, until he suddenly heard a certain sound. He started to run in the direction of the sound, knowing exactly what it was. Water. He stood in front of the river, staring at the water in awe. Nozaki walked into the water and started to yell in celebration, picking up the water into his hands and drinking it happily. But that wasn't going to be the end of his exploration. Next, he needed shelter, and so he walked off back into the forest. If he was going to find food, he would need to find a place that was not too close to the water. Not too long after walking back into the forest, he found a large, hollow tree with an entrance as tall as he was, making this tree the perfect one. He decided he was going to live there and sat down, starting to think about what he would do for food. Nozaki observed his arms, after having applied fruit juice on his arms to make sure that it didn't inflame him. If it did, the fruit juice was not edible and he would have to find other fruit. Luckily, he had no sort of reaction, and so he started to take small bites from the fruit and planned to wait a few hours to make sure he didn't have an allergic reaction or something. Even if he did end up being allergic to this fruit, he gladly had a large range of food around him that looked edible. Now, the last thing he needed to do was make a fire. He grabbed a stick and started to spin it on another. At first, it didn't work. In fact, it didn't succeed for a few hours, no matter what he tried. But fortunately, after so much time, a spark appeared and he had made a decent fire, calling it the most beautiful one he had ever seen. But fortunately, after so much time, a spark appeared, and he had made a decent fire. He called it the most beautiful one he had ever seen. Nozaki had sat by the fire for a while, wondering how long it would take for him to get out of the forest. He laid down, ready to sleep so he could prepare for hunting the next day, until suddenly a message box appeared in front of him. Surprised, Nozaki shot up and stared at it. It was showing his status and skills. He seemed to only have one skill, karate, but he didn't feel offended by it, feeling as though it suited him perfectly. The next day, he started to hunt. He sat on the branch of a tree with a large stick as a weapon, waiting for an animal to walk into the trap that he had made by memory. He had heard a noise, and out came a rabbit-like creature. Nozaki was disappointed by the size of it, thinking that it was too small for the trap. The creature heard something and started to run away. As Nozaki realized that something was coming, he looked over and saw goblins start to walk out into the opening. He was both amazed by the fact they were real and a little worried because he wouldn't be able to fight them. 
Nozaki realized that they were starting to walk toward the trap he set up, thinking that it could be his chance to get some experience. The goblin walked up to the trap and sniffed the air, and Nozaki started to think that the trap might not work if the smell wasn't erased. He was right. The goblins easily saw through the trap and pulled off the straw on top of the hole, shocking Nozaki. This left him no choice but to jump off the tree and swing at the goblins. He easily knocked out one of the three goblins with his stick, it exploding from impact. Nozaki looked at the other goblins with determination in his eyes. He charged at the other one as it continued to look surprised at its fallen comrade. Kicking the goblin in the neck, Nozaki sent the goblin flying. He turned over to the last goblin to try and quickly finish it off, only to realize that it was already trying to swing at him with its club. It used a heavy attack from the top, making the goblin have a large opening for a counterattack. Using that to his advantage, Nozaki had punched the goblin square in the face and sent it flying. However, this did not knock it out as the goblin quickly got back up, making Nozaki think that their vital points could be different from a human's. It growled at him and started to blindly attack him. Nozaki was struggling to keep up with the attacks, knowing that he couldn't approach the monster at that moment. But he had come up with an idea, putting its foot under a root and pretending to fall. Doing this had made the goblin believe that it had an opening, but Nozaki did this on purpose to lure another attack from the top. He easily dodged the attack and karate chopped the goblin in the neck. The goblin fell down to the ground, face planting, and was officially dead. It sat there as Nozaki stared at its fallen form, ready to see if he would get experience from it when he held his foot over the monster. With a crunch, he had smashed the heads of all three goblins. Nozaki continued to stare at what he had done until he started to shake with shock and amazement. He was excited at the fact that he won his first fight against some of the monsters of the world. Once night came, he walked back to his shelter and started to cook the meat from the goblins. There were some other spoils that he had gotten and put it on a stick near him. Pelts from the goblins that he could make into clothes later. Nozaki checked his status and realized that he leveled up. He stared up at the sky with determination in his eyes, yelling out loudly that he could do it, that he could get through it without a problem. And so time passed. A man was seen running through the forest, chasing a boar-like creature. He yelled at it to stop, trying his best to not let it get away. This man was Nozaki, and it had been three months since he had come to the world. Ever since his first day, he had grown a head of hair and a beard and became level 8. Nozaki's senses had been becoming sharper as his level rose. Because of this, he was able to tell that the animal was about to turn left. With a leap, he charged forward and successfully grabbed the leg of the animal and caused it to fall over. His physical ability was also improving as time went on. Putting the animal on his back, he was about to leave until he glanced behind him and realized that there were some chili peppers near where he caught the animal or at least a plant that looked identical to chili peppers. These plants could be used for insecticide, sterilization, or for its restorative properties. So Nozaki wanted to take as many as possible. While he was picking them, he heard some goblins nearby. He thought that they were being noisy and that he should kill them, but changed his mind once he remembered that it probably wouldn't matter when thinking about his levels. He started to worry that he had become the forest's king in the three months that he had been there. Suddenly, the goblins became quiet, and something had roared loudly in a part of the forest. Nozaki was in shock and fear, not knowing what could have possibly made that sound, especially since he hadn't seen many monsters other than the goblins in the past three months that he had been here. But lo and behold, out came this large creature. It held a blade in its hand. Nozaki believed that the creature in front of him was an evolved form of a goblin, a hobgoblin, which was almost twice the size of the goblins. He thought that the hobgoblin was going to reprimand the goblins for arguing with each other, but that wasn't the case. The hobgoblin gripped his blade tightly before suddenly swinging at the scared goblins, cutting their bodies in half. Nozaki was in complete shock, mouth agape as he realized that there was no way he could kill that monster. Ever since he came to this world, this was the first time he met a monster stronger than him. Unfortunately, the hobgoblin started to run at him because it had finally spotted Nozaki. It roared and chased him down through the forest. For the first time, he was the one being hunted. Nozaki ran as fast as he could through the forest in order to lose the monster, but it kept coming. Suddenly, however, the monster was starting to slow down. Nozaki realized with a body that huge, it would start to be an obstacle in the forest. But this wouldn't be the last that he would see the monster, as it had a sharp nose, especially as an evolved goblin. That was when Nozaki realized that the forest would not be safe for him anymore, since the hobgoblin would not give up at any point until he was dead. His only choice was to try and get out of the forest, since he knew he couldn't fight them. Despite his body shaking, he ran home and gathered up all his things and got ready to leave, saying goodbye to his first home. And so he was off. He started his trudge through the forest, only stopping and taking rests when the days became night. 
And even when it was night, he felt shaken up now that he knew that monsters such as hobgoblins existed in the forest and could come out and attack him at any time. He was always checking his surroundings every second. Each day, he would pass through the forest and its rivers, and climb the mountains until he would find a new place to call home. At one point, he passed by a lake and drank some of its water, jumping up when he realized there was a deer-like animal with two heads near him, also trying to drink the water, while staring at him at the same time. Then night came. He sat under a tree root, sat with his head in between his knees while he shook from the cold. He didn't know how many days it had been since he had left his shelter, thinking about wanting to find a city soon as he started to doze off. He just wanted to meet another human. The next day came and he continued his journey. A cheetah-like animal had passed by and Nozaki had hidden himself in the mud in order to not be seen by the animal as it would have been hostile otherwise. He jumped out of the mud for a breath of fresh air as the mud dripped down his body. He was glad that having a muddy swamp in the forest saved his life at that moment, and so he continued through the forest once he had gotten cleaned up from the mud. He turned the corner and saw that something was on the hill that was close to him, thinking it might be another monster. He hid in the bushes and looked up at it, his eyes widening when he realized what it truly was. It was another human. He stared at the girl with surprise and awe as he watched her pick from the ground to put in the basket next to her. She turned around and saw Nozaki trying to get her attention, surprising the girl. Once she had seen him, she started to look extremely worried, and supposedly told Nozaki to not come any closer, confusing the man greatly. The woman screamed goblin, confusing Nozaki even more as she started to run away in a different direction from him. Why was she scared of him? He was frustrated that this was his first experience with another human, thinking that he caused it, until he heard a roar and a scream from the woman who had run away. He realized who had caused that familiar roar and started to run in the direction of it, that roar was from a hobgoblin. He continued to run as fast as he could, knowing that it was not only just a hobgoblin, but the one that was set on killing him from the moment they met. He started to feel bad for the girl that had been captured by the monster, thinking that it had all been his fault because he messed around too much in the forest. Nozaki was finally able to start catching up to the hobgoblin, finally able to see him and the girl that was on his shoulder. He screamed at the monster to let her go, but the monster didn't seem to listen. Nozaki shouted one last time to get its hands off the girl, finally catching its attention as it turned around in surprise. Once it turned, it saw Nozaki leaping into the air with a battle cry. He had grabbed onto the vine that was in front of him on the tree branch and used it to continue on and keep his speed, while he had started to get closer to the hobgoblin. Finally, face to face with the monster, Nozaki had kneed him in the face, colliding with his nose and causing the monster to drop the girl. He landed on the ground with no problem and looked up only to realize that the monster had not fallen, only seeming to just be slightly phased by the attack done on it. Nozaki was shocked and in disbelief at the fact that it didn't fall whatsoever after eating the hit. He quickly looked over to the girl who was still trying to get up after falling off the hobgoblin, asking her if she was okay and could she stand, to which she confirmed. Nozaki ordered the girl to run while he took care of the monster. He wondered if the girl got separated from her group, but dismissed that thought and told her to go anywhere but where she was at that moment, to which she listened immediately. The hobgoblin looked over, finally having recovered as blood dropped from its nose. As the girl started to run off in another direction, Nozaki turned around and faced the monster once more, with more confidence than ever compared to what he had when he first met the beast all those weeks ago. Even with his confidence, he had no choice but to fight the monster. Getting into position, Nozaki stared at the monster in front of him, and prepared for battle. Nozaki trembled as he heard his heart beat fast. He felt that the pressure of facing this hobgoblin was almost the same as it would be if he were to fight a bear. All he wanted to do was run away, but he couldn't since he had to protect the girl. Yelling at the monster to come forward, the hobgoblin swung its blade at Nozaki, the man swiftly dodging. He realized that the attacks were heavy yet had large motions, meaning that the battle would be won by who was the fastest. He took his turn to strike, but he soon learned that it would not be easy. The hobgoblin's skin was way too tough for a punch to land, so Nozaki realized that a single punch would be almost useless against it. He thought about how unfair it was that he couldn't scratch it while he would instantly die from a single attack. Needing to try a different approach, he kicked the monster in its private parts, instantly stunning it. Once he realized that it worked, Nozaki swiftly headbutted the monster, punched it, and charged forward at it only to poke his fingers into its eyes. The monster screeched in pain, blood starting to pour from its eye as Nozaki was happy with his success. The hobgoblin started to wildly punch toward him, unfortunately connecting with Nozaki, and Nozaki was sent flying. Rolling across the ground, he struggled to get up from the impact of the hit. He stood once more and wiped the blood off of him, 
looking forward at the monster who is starting to double in his vision. He needed to find a way to take care of this beast fast, considering it was this strong despite his blocks. The monster continued to swing at him until Nozaki found out one last move he could pull that would give him any chance at winning. A high kick. The monster stared intensely at Nozaki until he was suddenly out of his line of vision. The man speeding forward to land a high kick from his blind spot. He hoped that the move would finally make the monster fall, and as it tumbled over with blank eyes, it seemed as if it were it. But suddenly, the monster came back to life and charged forward. He grabbed Nozaki and bit into his shoulder hard, causing him to scream in agony. As he felt as though his arm was being bitten off, he knew that he couldn't die in such a place as he was. Nozaki brought out his middle finger and gave the hobgoblin a few choice words, stabbing his finger into the monster's ear. This had caused the monster to kick Nozaki away and send him flying toward a tree. He sat there, head hung low as he bled from his shoulder and his middle finger was broken. He started to feel his consciousness slip away. He thought it would be the end, until he realized that there was a chili pepper-like plant in front of him. It would taste super hot, but it was the last thing he could do at that moment, not knowing whether it would stimulate him or kill him. The hobgoblin stared him down and roared, starting to charge at Nozaki. Then he consumed the pepper. The monster came closer and closer, ready to punch him until his eyes opened and he swiftly got up. He dodged the attack and spit the pepper into the monster's eyes, causing it to stumble back in pain. Nozaki leapt into the air and smashed the monster's head with his elbow and knee. Finally, the monster was down. Both Nozaki and the dead hobgoblin laid on the ground together, as Nozaki stared into the sky with shock. He won. He finally won. Unfortunately, he couldn't move any part of himself because he had exerted all of his energy and strength. Nozaki started to lose consciousness and close his eyes. That was until he heard someone calling out to him. It was the girl's voice. She was calling out to check on him to see if he was okay, still seeming to call him a goblin. He wondered who she was calling a goblin before he quickly went unconscious once more, as the girl had realized that he was bleeding, and so he was taken to the village that she was from. He opened his eyes to realize he was in an unfamiliar location. He laid in the bed before quickly getting up and wondering where he was. The pain in his shoulder suddenly shot through his body as the memories of fighting the hobgoblin came back to him, and he wondered if the girl had helped him. Nozaki knew that the house was a human house, meaning that it was likely that the girl had brought him there. A few months after coming to another world, he finally made it to a human town. He started to look at the bed that he was on, wondering if that bed was used by the girl's entire family. Suddenly, the girl had barged in through the door, glad he was finally awake. He started to wave his arms wildly, blushing and saying that he wasn't smelling anything in the house, until the girl said that he needed to leave immediately. Nozaki was confused, until the girl explained that the villagers were coming for him and wanted to attack him. Nozaki was shocked, asking why they would do that. She gestured at him to look out the window. His eyes widened as he saw villagers grouped up outside with pitchforks and weapons. Malice in their eyes. He asked the girl if she was the one that saved him. The villagers started to close in and come closer to the house as Nozaki asked what he would have done to have them so eager to want to kill him. She explained that hobgoblin materials were extremely rare and could be traded for a high price. This let Nozaki know that the villagers were there to kill him and take the items from him. One of the villagers told the others to wait as he walked to the door. He knocked on it and asked for the village pharmacist to open the door which Nozaki asked the girl if that was who she was, but the girl shushed him. She yelled at the villagers to go home, not wanting them to lay a finger on her patient, but the man said that they would get along. The man started to explain that it was his father who was the mayor of the village and protected them. He thought it was cold of her to hit an old woman, telling her to show them that it would be different. He claimed that he would only just kill Nozaki if they didn't get along, but the both of them felt like that was a lie. The girl said that it wasn't proven yet that he was the one who killed the goblin, and for villagers not to enter through the back door. Focusing back on Nozaki, she gave the man an ointment to be used at least three times a day. He was about to tell her something until she told him to not worry about her, telling him that patients should keep quiet and listen to the pharmacist. Suddenly, Nozaki heard that the villagers were planning to just kill them both, until it was interrupted by someone who said that killing a pharmacist would be a problem. One of the men was planning to get permission from his father in order to kidnap the girl and drug her later, shocking Nozaki. They continued to discuss this, saying that they didn't want her to break too soon. Nozaki held his fist tightly and wondered if the girl was really not hearing what the villagers were saying outside. She didn't want him to escape back to the forest, but it might have to happen since she felt unable to protect him. 
telling him to be careful and thanked him for saving her. She suddenly started to run toward the front door before Nozaki can do anything. He tried to run after her to stop her before he fell to the floor in pain. The girl ran outside and stood in front of the door in order to try and protect Nozaki. He cursed, knowing that he couldn't do anything more for her, and did as he was told. He ran away. He left the house through the back door and ran to the forest once more, struggling with each step. He felt as though he was losing more of his physical strength each second. He suddenly heard someone calling out to him, the villagers having noticed that he woke up and was already trying to run away. He looked back at the men and realized that they had taken the girl. One of the men called her difficult and slapped her, saying that she deceived them. This action angered Nozaki greatly, as the man who acted like the leader ordered the rest of the villagers to find Nozaki and kill him. Once the man had lifted his face, Nozaki engraved its appearance in his mind, making sure that he would remember it so he could plan his revenge in the future. He would make them pay for hurting that girl. And so Nozaki ran back off to the good old reliable forest. He sat under the glowing moon, sitting by a fire he had made while he cooked his food, putting the ball of food in his mouth. He thought about that man and how the other villagers were harming that girl like it wasn't a problem. He stared up at the sky, asking whoever it was out there for him to go home. He really wanted to be out of the world that he was in. Dismissing his thoughts, he went to sleep and waited for the next day. He was starting to fix up a new base for himself, seeing how it was growing since the last base had some errors in his eyes. Starting to do some exploration in the forest, he was trying to find some more food for him to eat. He found some plants in the ground, seeing how the vegetation of the new world was very similar to his old world. The fruit he had found had yam-like plants under it. It would have been very difficult to hunt for food if his wounds were to open up, so it was good that he found food that would keep him going for a while. He planned to store it while he waited for the night to come. After night came, he checked his status once more. He realized that he had leveled up twice and developed something called Angry Waves after he had met the Hobgoblin. He looked back on everything that happened as soon as he was sent into the new world. He had met people for the first time, fought a Hobgoblin, and now people were wanting to kill him. But once he found out that last part, he knew that the people of this world were no different to the previous world. Some people that liked him, such as the girl, and some people that didn't such as the man with the mark around his eye. He wished for the death of the people who had murderous intentions towards him. He was planning to prepare himself in the future, not just in his body, but for the fight in his head. He truly wondered if he would be prepared for the battle. What he didn't know was that the girl was not having a good experience, her clothes seeming to be ripped off without her consent. What was happening to her? Nozaki had finally woken up, struggling to get up after all the exhaustion he had before. He looked up and his eyes widened as he realized that there was a snake-like monster in front of him. He swiftly grabbed it by its neck, incapacitating it while he investigated if he could use it for food. It wasn't much, but he cooked it in order to finally have meat after so long. He had remembered the remarks from that man. He learned that the girl came to the village with the pharmacist and his team, and once he had died, she inherited his role. This had meant that she had no family or support, as well as being isolated from the rest of the village. He dismissed his thoughts, as he needed to concentrate on his recovery. He dismissed his thoughts, as he needed to concentrate on his recovery, knowing that he should be able to regain all of his strength within a week. Until then, he was hoping that girl would be safe. The week quickly went by. Some animals were seen hanging around a pile of mud. They heard a sound and turned around, only to realize that there was a man who was emerging from the mud. That man was Nozaki, as the creatures had started to run away. Nozaki knew that that one person, his new target, was much different than a hobgoblin, so he needed to be even more prepared. He started to rub off lines of mud in his face, wondering if what he was doing was like the camouflage he had seen in movies. Nozaki wanted to avoid fighting them as much as possible, and walked off to continue his plan. It was time, and so he walked off toward the village. Two men were seen sitting in front of a house, seemingly there in order to keep watch to look for Nozaki. They believed that it was unlikely for him to come back. They wondered what was wrong with the girl that was taken, not wanting to mess with the actions that were happening and hoped that things would be cleared up soon. Nozaki was listening in by the side of the house and knew that he needed to use the back door. When he walked back there, he noticed a man, but he was glad that there was only one person there. Nozaki threw a rock at a tree to distract the guy, before swiftly jumping the man and knocking him out. He walked into the house successfully without being caught and saw the girl tied up to a pillar in the house. He ran in and asked if she was okay, grabbing her attention. He rubbed off the mud from his face and said that he came to help her leave the village with him. Nozaki started to untie the rope before saying that she would be staying in the village, confusing him greatly. She explained that all her patients were in the village and that she would supposedly be released soon as everyone was apparently not a bad person. 
When Ozaki had finally untied the ropes on her legs, he saw the injuries that she had received from the ropes. He also realized that the ropes on her arms were falling down. She yelled at him to leave her, as there would be too many men out there and that it would not end well for him. He stayed silent. Head hung low as some villagers walked into the building, ready to capture Nozaki. The man was happy to have finally been able to find Nozaki, until the door came flying toward him because Nozaki had kicked it out, smashing the man's body and knocking him out. More men had started to pour into the room as Nozaki prepared for the battle that was about to occur. Anger laced in his eyes. They charged at him, all at once without hesitation, and then there he was. That man whose face Nozaki burned into his mind. The man claimed that he was being careless last time, but that he would not let Nozaki escape. Nozaki told the man that if he took his request, he would let him live. His request for this man was for him not to do any more harm to Yakushi's daughter, and tell him all the stuff he did and apologize. The man told him to suck it, and ordered the others to kill Nozaki. He swiftly dodged each and every one of their attacks, seemingly yawning at their moves. Then when it was his turn, he immediately sent his fist flying toward the face of one of the men, sending him tumbling to the ground. They checked if he was okay and the man with the mark around his eye took the situation into his own hands, and said that he would be the one who would kill Nozaki. Nozaki got into position once more, knowing that the attacks would continue coming, starting to feel more tactile. The man saw Nozaki standing in place and laughed, asking him if he came to the fight on ready. This man's name would come to be known as Philip, one of the men who had grabbed his attention. Philip continued his egotistical rambling until one of the men yelled his name. He angrily asked what he wanted, until it was shown that the man that Nozaki had punched was dead just from that one punch. Nozaki stood there, eyes widened in amazement as he realized that he had truly killed another human. Everyone else in the room was also shocked by his actions, while Nozaki was lost in his thoughts. He wondered if humans were really so fragile. He gathered himself quickly and said that he wasn't shocked as that guy was probably just a big waste of space. Philip was enraged that Nozaki had easily killed one of his men without even using a weapon. Nozaki stood up once more and held up his fists, getting ready to fight back as he started to get surrounded. He was extremely confident that he could beat everyone in the room because of his fighting skills, as long as he just landed every one of his punches. There were eight men in the room, and three of them had fairly decent weapons while the other had farm tools to protect them. There had to be something else he could use other than his status and skills considering he had to be careful of the weapons. They shouldn't be able to see through his movements due to the physique of the world, so it was likely that he should be fine, as long as he kept himself close to his enemies. Nozaki charged at Philip, as he was the only one who had a shield and sword, and Philip had tried to stab Nozaki with his sword. But Nozaki had dodged it easily. Suddenly, he kicked the shield, making Philip laugh at the action. He had truly thought he could win the fight from Nozaki's actions. That was, until Nozaki's path of his leg had suddenly changed. Nozaki's leg had changed its trajectory and rotated, his foot successfully colliding with Philip's face. Philip was completely knocked out by this attack, not knowing how such a strong attack could exist. Falling to the ground, Philip was done, just like that. Nozaki had thought about what kick he had done and remembered that it was called a Brazilian kick. His thoughts were cut short by the rest of the men all charging at him. One tried to stab him with a spear, and another man had come up behind him and attempted to slash him with a sword. The man with the spear felt confident that this would be the end for Nozaki, thinking that he wasn't aware of the man behind him, but oh, he was wrong. Glancing behind him, Nozaki had swiftly turned around and elbowed the man behind him in the stomach, grabbing his body and throwing him to the ground, just before finishing it off by stomping his foot into the man's throat. The last of the men were terrified at the scene, seemingly as if they were about to run away, but through some luck they had stayed. Nozaki was annoyed, but he knew that he could win the battle in just one step. He told the last of the men that he was about to give them a really bad day, them starting to charge at him with no plan. The spearman came forward and Nozaki grabbed it once it had slipped past him, shocking the man. He pulled at his spear, telling Nozaki to let go, and that was what he did. He let go of the spear and the spearman had stumbled back, almost falling as Nozaki announced that he was going to do his best to beat up every last one of them. Once the spearman was tumbling over, Nozaki had dashed forward and punched him in the face, blood covering his fists once the two had stopped connecting. The rest of the men had had enough, and started to run away from the sight of the scene and from Nozaki altogether. Some of them had even thrown up from the bloodshed before they had left, screaming that there was a monster. Nozaki was glad that he had gotten rid of everyone, before there was another man who had walked into the area, yelling about Philip. It was his father, and he asked what had happened here. He checked to see if his son was alive, but 
He wasn't. He stood back up, tears running down his face as he angrily asked Nozaki if he was the one who killed his son. Nozaki didn't answer the question, instead asking his own question of whether the man in front of him was the one in charge. Suddenly, Philip's father ordered someone named Hegert to kill Nozaki for his action, and a man clothed in armor had stepped into the battlefield. He had apparently been fed by Philip's father up until now just for this moment. The armored man told Philip's father that he was aware of that, and that he would repay the favor of picking him up when he was little, due to his father banishing him from the city. Hegert held his blade in his hands, and told Nozaki that he would do well as rust on the sword. Nozaki had recognized the armor to be plate armor, and got ready for another battle. Nozaki wondered what he was supposed to do, as the energy from this new enemy was too much of a difference from the men he had previously fought. On top of that, there were no gaps in his stance. Nozaki knew that this man was a strong person, and started to sweat with worry. He wanted to bring the battle into one of attrition. He glanced over to see that Philip's father was walking over to the men who were still there, and ordering them to bring back those who had ran away, and even to give women and children a weapon as he wanted Nozaki dead at all costs. Nozaki needed to focus on calming down his breathing, as it was starting to be all over the place. He started to take deep breaths and finally started to calm down. He needed to figure out a plan, because if he rushed into battle, his enemy would surely make use of it. So he started to analyze his opponent, not wanting to overlook any details no matter how small. He noticed the way that Hegert had shifted his center of balance was weird, seemingly trying to cover his left leg. It reminded Nozaki of the time he was injured in the knee, having to struggle through physical rehabilitation as the knee played a vital role in attacking and defending. If that was the case, Nozaki theorized, Hegert would use a wide lunge attack at him at that range, as it would be the most effective. Nozaki chuckled at the man for not having moved yet, and claimed he was scared. Suddenly, Hegert had finally moved and did just as Nozaki predicted, lunging forward with his sword, to which Nozaki easily dodged. Or, at least that's what he thought he could do. He only barely dodged it, the tip of the sword having grazed his neck, causing blood to spill. Nozaki realized how dangerous this man was, knowing that if his knee was fine, he would have been killed. Hegert started to solidify his guard, but Nozaki's goal was the armored man's left knee. He crouched over and dashed at Hegert's leg, curling around it and causing the man to fall over as he started to bend the joint. Nozaki knew that no matter how strong a person's armor was, it wouldn't improve the strength of their joints. Once it had snapped, Nozaki sped over to curl around Hegert's neck, squeezing the head of the armor with his arms. With one swift motion, Hegert was down. His arm had fallen to the ground once Nozaki knew that the battle was over, standing up slowly. He let go of the man's body and set him down on the ground. Nozaki was amazed that the day had come where he would snap a person's neck. But finally, the battle was over. But really, it wasn't quite over yet. He looked over at Philip's father and walked over to him. He started to step back in fear, tripping over a rock and falling to the ground. The man had started to beg for his life, but Nozaki has said that it was him who had wished for the slaughter to happen. Suddenly, the man claimed that he would curse Nozaki and drag him along to hell, to which Nozaki apologized by saying he was an atheist, though, and cursed himself for not having his son and his men to have them set out their plans sooner. Nozaki said that he didn't want to talk anymore and walked towards the man as he started to scream. And that was the end of that man. Nozaki stood proudly after finishing the battle, speaking to himself that it was them who had started it by stealing the hobgoblin materials from him and harming the girl. Once he remembered about the girl, he jumped as he thought he forgot about her restraints. But the girl had run out of the building, calling out for him. He wondered how she had gotten out of the ropes before she explained that another patient of hers had noticed her and came to help her. He realized that she would have witnessed all that he had done, about to try and explain himself, but she knew exactly what had happened, having heard what the mayor said. Dismissing all that happened, she told Nozaki that it was time for them to leave the village as soon as possible, allowing herself to come along as well. She had known that after the incident, it would be best if she were to leave, as her strength was no longer needed regardless of whether the village would deteriorate or rejuvenate. Nozaki realized that the girl would be considered his ally while he was the target of fear, causing the girl to no longer longer have a home. He understood that and asked her, before they went, for her to grab whatever she wanted as he would be able to carry it. Once she was done packing, Nozaki had realized that she had packed quite a lot, a large backpack sitting on the ground. He sweat dropped before telling the girl that it was time to go. She took one last look at the village before turning to him and smiling and agreeing. As they walked away from the village, Nozaki knew that the girl's facial expression at that moment would be one he could never forget. They carried along with their path 
predicting that it would be a few more hours before they were able to leave the forest. The girl explained that just outside the forest, there would be a main road with inns scattered along it. During their journey, Nozaki started to explain how he had gotten to where he was, only telling her that he had lost his memories once he arrived at the forest. They had continued to chat, starting to get to know each other. Nozaki had started to realize that his head started to become weird. He felt as though he was having fun traveling with this girl. They were still conversing, but he was distracted by the fact that he could talk so comfortably with this girl because she had resembled someone he knew long ago. Three days passed and they had set up camp somewhere. Nozaki sat by the fire, realizing that it was a mistake for them to have skipped the inn, but now they were stuck with camping. Once he saw that no one was looking, he thought it would be a good time to check his status. The girl had told him that apparently the masters of the world would use the church's magical device to check their levels, meaning the fact that he could check his own was abnormal. Once the status box had popped up, he realized that not only was he at level 15, he had also gained two new skills of sense and conceal. He had also realized that his title was a goblin, wondering who was managing the system of statuses, and if that god who sent him to the world was involved with it. The other title he had was Monster, one he had gotten after killing those people from earlier. This was Nozaki's first night that he couldn't sleep after killing a person. He thought it was fitting for him. Knowing that the experience he had gotten was from humans, he wondered how the leveling would look like if a war were to happen. The next day, the girl asked about this war that Nozaki was wondering about, and he was wondering if it would just be easy for someone to become level 100. She explained that it was unlikely for something like that to happen. Nozaki assumed by that response that there might be a system in place to prevent that, and proceeded to ask her what would happen when the same species killed each other. The girl walked forward before realizing that Nozaki had stopped in place. Head hung low. She asked him if there was something wrong. His fists trembled as he played back the girl's words. When the same species killed each other, the experience was almost nothing. But when he killed people, his levels went up considerably. He wondered what exactly he was as the title of monster flashed through his mind. The girl asked him if he needed medicine as the man continued to stare into the sky in a serious expression. Finally, the two of them found a place for them to stay. Nozaki sat in bed, still thinking about what the girl had told him. He knew that he was different than humans since he had somehow gained experience from killing other humans. He definitely could not let this fact be found out, as he would immediately be disposed of as a potential threat. Suddenly, someone had walked into the room, alerting his attention. It was the girl who had just gotten out of the bath, her asking him what he was doing in there. She told him to leave, as she thought she had already told him to go to the cafeteria before her, throwing a towel in his face. He tried to excuse himself by saying that he was thinking of something, and so the two of them went to eat. They both were celebrating a toast for the safe journey they had. They had started to eat their food and were enjoying it greatly. Nozaki was glad that the journey was going to be over the next day. Because it was ending, he knew that he would stop growing fond of the girl. If he stayed with her, he would surely bring her misfortune and fall in love with her. After the feast, they had continued their trek and finally arrived at their destination. The girl pointed and called for Nozaki's attention, telling him that she could see the city the city being named Rockcliff. They stared with surprise and amazement that they had finally made it. They walked over to the line that was leading into the city, Nozaki covering himself with a hood, just in case anything bad would come of it if he didn't. The closer they had gotten to the city, the more impressive it looked to them. The guard asked for the next group of people to inspect, and the two of them knew it was their turn. The girl walked up to the guard and tried to take something out of her bag, not knowing if it would work as an entrance pass. Nozaki was starting to worry wondering if he would be put on a wanted list after the incident at the village. The girl had finally pulled out a letter from her elder sister apprentice. The guards realized that she was an acquaintance of someone named Claren. They quickly let the two of them in and waved them goodbye as they entered the city. Nozaki was beyond shocked that they had entered that easily, wondering who Claren was. The girl had explained that Claren was the adopted daughter of the feudal lord, Earl Megan. Nozaki was shocked by this information and let the girl lead the way. They walked through the city and Nozaki was looking around wildly at the unfamiliar yet astonishing surroundings. He expected it since it was a city that flourished from its trade, but was still amazed by how lively it was. He was glad there were many various human races around, so he wouldn't stand out too much in crowds. Suddenly, the girl had called for Nozaki to hurry up somewhere, making him realize he had been dawdling. They had finally arrived at this old house, where a woman was seen walking an old person outside, waving goodbye to the old man and telling him not to get sick anymore. The woman turned around and saw the girl waving at her, surprised at her presence. The girl, Belle, ran up to the woman with excitement in her eyes. This woman was the person that Belle had mentioned, Claren. The two women had hugged each other, greeting each other after having not seen each other for so long. 
Claren looked up and had a more serious expression before asking the two what had happened to them after Nozaki had greeted the woman himself. After Nozaki had explained what had happened, Claren understood the situation and thanked Nozaki for doing well in bringing Belle to her. Claren walked up to the house and started to bring Belle into the house as she wanted her to get some rest. Belle stopped, saying that Nozaki still needed to come with, and still calling him a goblin. She turned around to see that Nozaki wasn't moving, and this is when she realized that Nozaki said that this was the end of his journey. Claren knew exactly who he was and what he had done, telling him that he needed to be careful out there as he had still killed someone who had the blood of a noble. He thanked her and started to turn around, Belle continuing to call out to him, but Claren cut her off by saying that Nozaki was thinking about her future. Nozaki told Belle to take care and fully turned around, not wanting to look back. Belle was silent for a moment before bursting out one last time with a smile, telling Nozaki as well to take care of himself. And now, Nozaki was by himself once more. He sat at a fountain trying to collect his thoughts before he suddenly jumped up and slapped himself in the face. It wasn't time for him to feel down. Instead, it was time to continue his journey of survival. He walked up to someone and asked them for directions to somewhere. He walked in that direction knowing that he needed to make money while he was here. He needed to become an adventurer while he was at the city. Finally, he had found the Adventurer's Guild. Facing the large wooden doors in front of him, he took a deep breath and started to walk into what would be the start of his second chapter. He started to think about what to expect within the guild, and what kind of new life he would be leading. Nozaki started to think back on all the RPG games he had played, thinking that he could be meeting face to face with a hostess of a tavern, or a receptionist who would give blessings, imagining the image in his head. However, that was not the case as he was met with an old man. The man asked him if he was there to register, to which Nozaki nodded and the man pointed at a paper for him to sign. Nozaki struggled, but the old man told him that anything that resembled a word would do, as many people at the guild also couldn't write as the priority was how well a person could do a job. The old man had suggested for Nozaki to not listen to the small talk of the other guild members. Nozaki realizing that people had made guilds within the bar as is. All the customers were adventurers. All of them seemingly to have been observing Nozaki the moment he walked in. A group at a table were discussing how Nozaki seemed like a dangerous guy. One of the men asked if another at the table, Kaimon, agreed, to which he did. Another person at the table said he didn't like the situation, rising from the table and grabbing his weapon as he didn't like Nozaki staring at them. The man with the ponytail told the man with the weapon to leave Nozaki alone, but it didn't seem to stop him as the man prepared to walk toward him. When would Nozaki catch a break? The large man with the weapon had walked up to Nozaki, angrily asking him what he was staring at. Nozaki started to tremble, but stood his ground as the man towered over him. The large man called him annoying, while the old man at the counter told the two men that if they were going to fight, they should do it outside. Nozaki knew that he was being too direct when he was staring at the group of people, knowing that making an uproar on the first day would be bad. This man was strong, but he had no choice and got ready for another battle. Except this one would be one of ass-kissing instead of using fists. Nozaki rubbed the back of his neck and apologized, saying that he thought the man was so amazing that he just felt the need to stare. The large man was silent, before starting to believe Nozaki's words. Nozaki had put up both an accent and a personality to make his lie believable. The other people at the table watched, one of the men with a smile on his face. After Nozaki had finished his rambling, he waited to see if it would work, as not a single person had seemingly dodged that onslaught before. The man gripped his weapon, saying that Nozaki talked too much, causing Nozaki to believe what he did may not have an effect on seasoned adventurers. But luckily, he would find that it worked perfectly, and was super effective on the man, as Nozaki looked up at the bashful man. Nozaki internally laughed at how easy it was to lie to this man. He continued it some more by saying that he would buy a drink for the man, and after two hours, only the people at the table and Nozaki were in that bar now. The drunken man laughed with a few women that he had met while everyone is chatting with each other. The man with the ponytail looked over and greeted Nozaki, introducing himself as Al. Nozaki smiled back, but he knew that this man named Al was a sharp man, so he had to be cautious. Al asked for confirmation if Nozaki's name was Yajin, saying that it was a name he wouldn't get used to hearing. Nozaki explained his name and appearance being unusual by claiming that his grandmother was bought as a slave and came to Rock Cliff from a far place. The boy next to him had jumped into the conversation, saying that his younger sister was also sold as a slave. Al said the boy was Kaimon and to not mind his taciturn nature. Nozaki said that it was nice to meet the boy, and Al wondered what the group should do next, as the large man, whose name was Gons, had disappeared somewhere with those women he had been with. 
Nozaki asked Al if he could tell him about the surrounding region, as he claimed that his mother lived in a rural farming village and never went out much, which is why he didn't know much about the world. That was a lie as well, but Al pulled out a map of the region's subnational groups, pointing out where Rockcliffe would be. Nozaki started to get excited from the new information that he was learning. In the north was the Forest Sanctuary, led by a self-proclaimed subnational group. In the west was Aslark Kingdom, in the east was the Chrysar Kingdom, and in the south was Mariano Kingdom. Nozaki noticed that the closest border was to the west, and so he needed to remember that. He pointed somewhere else on the map and asked about it, to which Al said that it was an extremely enormous nation called the Migad Empire, and was a nice place to live if one was an ordinary citizen. The night went by and the two men had continued to chat with each other, laughing with one another while Kaimon seemed to be asleep. Nozaki decided that it was time to go, and walked up the stairs of the bar and bade goodbye to the others. Al thanking Nozaki for the enjoyable night. Nozaki walked into one of the rooms where he would sleep for the night and sat on the bed, inspecting how much money he had left. It wasn't much, and he didn't think he could buy a decent set of armor with the amount that he had, which is why he needed to find a quick way to earn money. The bag of money was left over from Bell. He originally refused it at first, as he was planning to sell what he had hunted and collected on the road, and if something happened, he would just camp outside. Bell wasn't satisfied with this, saying that he would at least have the money to live. She had also said that she was letting him borrow it, and for him to return with twice the amount. Nozaki hid his face between his knees while he sadly thought back on the memories of that girl, the moment almost being tainted by the sounds of Gons and those women in the other room. The next day came and Nozaki was ready. He splashed water in his face from a nearby well and went back inside the inn with a plan. He was going to get himself to be in the party of that one group he had talked with last night. It seemed doable to him since he made a great first impression the previous day. He walked up to the group and said that he wanted to be added to their party, claiming that he wanted to become an adventurer like Gons. Gons took the words the wrong way and thought that Nozaki had intended to leech off of him in their party, confusing Nozaki greatly. Al quickly jumped in and told Gons to calm down, as Nozaki, who went by Yajin, had come from a rural area. Al asked Nozaki if he knew what base value was, to which the man said he didn't. A person's stats were represented by their strength, endurance, intelligence, willpower, and dexterity. Within those, the most important for an adventurer were strength and endurance. While a base value was the amount a person started with, stats were decided by base value and level, and if his base values were lower than the desired amount in a job, he wouldn't be the best. Nozaki asked how the base values were decided, to which Al explained that strength and endurance were decided by one's body physique at birth. Al asked Nozaki if he had noticed that everyone in the inn except for Kaimon were all taller than him. Gons jumped into the conversation and said that because their group couldn't break through a supposed level ceiling, they were still at level 6 despite being the strongest party in Rockcliffe. They explained that unless he had a special talent like Kaimon, he would never have a place in their party. Nozaki still didn't want to give up and asked what a special talent was. Al explained that it was the skills a person had, and that, for example, they were looking for someone who was specialized as a scout with the sense presence skill, as it was difficult to acquire. Nozaki was silent for a moment, making the others think that he was spacing out, but that was until Nozaki had finally spoke with hope in his eyes, saying that he had the skills of the scout tree. The party was shocked by this information and talked within the group. They had finally said that Nozaki couldn't just have them believe his words blindly, and Gons cut in by saying that Nozaki would have to show off his skills and practice. And so Nozaki was off, every one of the people in the group showing off their skills while Nozaki was waiting for his turn. It was a spectacle that he wanted to cover his eyes from. Kaimon had used his judgment skills to pick out good armor, then Gons used his natural threatening demeanor to scare the shopkeeper and have Al haggle the shopkeeper while smiling as if they weren't doing anything wrong. The shopkeeper gave the group the armor begrudgingly, and Nozaki had finally gotten an extremely good piece of armor that was bought at a terribly affordable price. Nozaki stopped in place for a moment and apologized to the group, saying that he was grateful that they had let him take the test to join the party and went out of their way to help him get equipment. He was confident that he would pass the test, so the group wouldn't have done what they did for him for nothing. Gon smacked Nozaki's back and told him to not worry about it, as if he failed, he would just retrieve the armor from his dead body and sell it back for money. The group walked away from him after casually telling Nozaki that, making Nozaki remember what kind of world he was in. The test was tomorrow, and Gon's told him to sleep well that night. The next day, the group was set off for a mission, one that would put Nozaki to the test and prove that he would be useful to the group. Everyone was geared up and ready to go. In the end, Nozaki couldn't get to sleep. They made their long trek through the lands. Al was inspecting a paper with a job description that they were about to set upon. It was a request for a subjugation of a wolf-type monster called a Grey Wolf. The person who requested the job seemed to want them to exterminate this monster as it was attacking the livestock. 
It would be close to a day trip for them, but the commission fee was not bad in Al's eyes. Nozaki realized that it was because the walking speed in this world was different compared to his previous world, and the most important stat in this moment would be endurance. But he wondered why this one specific request was left over on the board. People received rewards for completing requests put up on the notice board, but due to Gon sleeping in, it was the last one left when they arrived. Al explained that the Grey Wolves had a habit of hunting in multiples of 5, such as packs of 5 or 10. If one's true strength wasn't enough for the job, the tables could easily be turned, which is why people chose to avoid it. After some more walking, they had finally arrived at the village. Once they had walked in, they already saw the horrible scene that was in front of them. A sheep had laid on the ground, completely mangled from what the wolves had done to it. The citizens of the village said that this wasn't the first time it had happened to their livestock, and how the day was supposedly the third time. Nozaki felt pity for the citizens as they were constantly being worn down by the situation. A little girl who was named Maya walked up to the old man, her grandfather, who had been explaining the situation, and said that she wanted to make a proper grave for the sheep. It seemed that the little girl had a close relationship with the slaughtered sheep, and she continued to cry from its death. If this situation were to continue, the village would be destroyed, and the old man begged the adventurers to help them in any way. Al responded and said that they would need to hear the details before they could lend them their strength. The old man led Al somewhere, and Al told the others to wait here while he went off to learn about the situation. Gons had no words to say about it because he put his full trust in Al's negotiations, and if there was anything unwelcome, they would refuse the job and leave. Nozaki and Gons would be there while they waited, being on the lookout in order to see any strange movements. Gons knew that Nozaki was wondering why they would be on guard when the people around looked like nice people, but before he could explain more, Al had finished talking to the old man and walked up to them. Gons asked how it went, and Al said that they would be going ahead with the job, the monsters being located in the east of the forest. They set off for the forest, and Al continued to explain to Nozaki that he should remember that requesters can lie in order to make it seem easier to take on, or better in terms of money, and in that moment the only people to blame would be themselves. Nozaki was responsible for his own life, as he realized how tough the world really was. They finally arrived at the forest and got ready for the battle that could be occurring. Gon said that they would wait outside the forest, while Nozaki would go in and find out where the den of the Grey Wolves was, and then return to relay that information. Al told Nozaki to constantly use his conceal skill, because if he was found out, it would be over, as he would be found first before he found them. Before Nozaki walked off, Kaimon called for his attention, and told him to show them what he got making Al chuckle from the words of appreciation, as Nozaki would also be relieving Kaimon of the duty if he succeeded. And so Nozaki walked into the forest. It had been a while since he had walked in a wooded area ever since he had lived there for the first three months of his coming here. He felt out of place for an unknown reason, despite how familiar he used to be with the forest. Nozaki remembered that the Grey Wolves would be a larger version of those in his previous world, meaning that they must have a keen sense of smell. He jumped out of his thoughts, shaking his head as he said the forest wasn't his home. His priority was to erase his scent, he thought, as he looked around for some plants to rub on himself. He found some mint plants growing en masse near him and started to scrub the leaves all over his body, successfully erasing his scent. Knowing that the plants existed nearby, he was going to have Gons and the others do the same once he came back. He started to focus as he stood in place, as he knew that he needed to strengthen his senses and use his sense skill at full power completely tuning everything out around him and trying to find any sort of clue that could lead him to the den of the Grey Wolves. He could vaguely sense the presence of animals in the vicinity, but finding a specific monster with the skill alone would be unlikely. He remembered the info that Al gave him about the wolves, how they moved in multiples, and he used that to his advantage. He started to look around and noticed a large-sized animal's footprint in the dirt. It wasn't just footprints from one animal, but multiple. He used his sense skill again and shot up at the fact that he had noticed five presences nearby. Following a path toward those five presences, he had finally arrived near the wolf den, seeing the rabid beasts up close. He went back and let the others know, leading them to the same place that he had found and the others were proud of Nozaki's skills. They asked Al what their next plan would be, and Al asked Nozaki if he was sure that the wolves were the only enemies, to which Nozaki confirmed. Al grinned and told Nozaki that it was time for them to go wild and show Nozaki the true strength of their party, because they couldn't have a newcomer looking down on them. He told Nozaki to watch from afar and see them fight the wolves themselves. They walked into the cave with stealth. The group had made a plan with Nozaki before they went in for him to give them a signal when the wolves would have noticed them, meaning to start the battle. Nozaki watched closely and immediately noticed one of the wolves start to make a move. Nozaki jumped up and let the group know that they were spotted, calling for Kaimon to make a move. He pulled his bow back as one of the wolves ran outside and it was shot in the eye immediately. 
Gons rushed near it and prepared his axe, giving a battle cry before slashing the wolf. As Gons pulled his axe back, he heard the barks of two more wolves coming out of the cave. The two wolves had dashed toward him, but he was not phased by their presence, immediately cutting another in half with a single swing. Nozaki was amazed by Gon's skill in already having killed two of the wolves so quickly. The only problem was the fact that the movement of Gon's was too large. Another wolf was extremely close to biting Gon's until Al charged in and blocked the attack with his shield, sending the canine flying. Nozaki realized the strategy that was being played. Gon's would do these large movements while Al would make up for those movements and cover his back, protecting him. They were surrounded by three more wolves, but they would be no problem to them as Kaimon and Al would precisely dampen the enemy's mobility. The last wolf had staggered, arrows poking out of its limbs as Gons towered over it and made the final blow. He brought the axe down and the wolf had been decapitated, meaning that the group had won. Nozaki stared in awe at the power of this group as he knew this was truly the Rock Cliff's strongest party. The corpses of the savage beasts had lined the ground as the party had stood proudly after winning the battle. Nozaki sweat dropped as he felt the fearsome power of the group after having taken out the five wolves in just a flash. He continued to stare in awe until Gons walked up to him and asked him what he was staring around for, telling him that his job wasn't finished yet and to do his work properly as a newcomer. Everyone had their fair share of holding one of the wolves in order to bring them back. They moved the grey wolf corpses over to the river so they could dismantle them and get their materials. Nozaki, having helped Kaimon during the dismantling in order to learn. By the time they had returned to the village, the sky had gone dark, and while the villagers celebrated the success of the party, they recommended for them to change their plans and stay for the night for maximum safety. Nozaki wondered if the others took into account of him being experienced and tired, but he dismissed his thoughts, quickly getting back to chatting with the other villagers. One of the villagers asked if Nozaki was the one who found the den all by himself, but Nozaki said that he didn't do much. The little girl from earlier, Maya, had quickly walked up to Nozaki and thanked him with a smile, calling him uncle as well. Her grandfather reprimanded her for calling him that, while Nozaki just chuckled. With this, Nozaki was finally able to safely get over his debut battle as an adventurer, and the opportunity had now bought him the ability to be able to have many more journeys ahead of him. To be continued.